Hey, welcome back to more Live from the Heartland. You have just listened to Big Bill Morganfield, and that's Bloodstains on the Wall, and hopefully we'll have Big Bill back on the show sometime, and they're not too far off. We take a great pleasure, it's an honor to introduce now Susan Smith Richardson, and she is the editor, the publisher of the Chicago Reporter. They do great work, uh, and we're going to talk to you about a bunch of stuff you and your other people have been writing about. Yes, yes. Let's start with uh, the one-year anniversary of Laquan McDonald's video being released. How about giving us an update on police accountability? Oh, well, you've asked for it for the big take, haven't you? Uh, you know, right I think you can, uh, right, you can right answer it however bat. you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no. I, you know, I think that's an important question. And I bet, based on where you live, you may have a different answer, right, on where things are. Um, if we just look at what's happened in the last week, we all ought to still really be worried about, you know, what kind of accountability we have. Um, we've just come through this case involving uh, the young man, Ray, who was shot by a police officer, and it seems like we're starting, we're continuing to have some of these same cases that we've had before. What is that? Uh, I tried to write his, I knew his last name. What's his mm -hmm. first name? Kajan. Kajan, Kajan Ray, Ray, and today mm -hmm. is his funeral. Yes. So, you know, I think not to say that there hasn't been some improvement. We've had a police accountability task force that did, you know, have some findings and make some statements that I think were tough and surprised some people. Mm -hmm. But I think you really got to measure accountability by, by do, not what you say. And we're still having these same issues go on. Uh, because of work of advocates and journalists, we have seen that there is some more transparency that we didn't have, obviously, um, with the uh, Laquan McDonald case. But the issue clearly goes beyond just having more transparency. Transparency doesn't automatically mean accountability. And that's what we're seeing because we're still having these shootings. So there's a whole lot else that needs to be done to really improve accountability in this town. When, when uh, I first started reading the uh, Chicago Reporter, uh, it, it was when it was first started by John McDermott because it, it was its dedication was to um, shining the light on uh, interracial issues. Well, across. civil rights and poverty. Civil rights, poverty, and the city's play with, with all of the above. Depending on who the staff was, they would go different places. But what a, what an important publication to, to maintain. And I know you, you uh, combined with Catalyst, which was right. the school-centered uh, paper for right, a long time. education reform. So mm -hmm. are you doing both now with Chicago Reporter? Is that an easy marriage and a happy marriage as it were? <laughs> are any marriages happy? I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes. Sometimes. Let me not sound anti marriage, but I have to say it, I'm sorry. Uh, no, I, I think uh, I want to say a couple of things before I answer that directly. Sorry for the bad joke. <laughs> no, it's uh, good. But no, but uh, kinda let me just take it back to uh, Mr. McDermott, and also Lillian Calhoun, because they were the co-editors, and every time I go out, someone says to me, what about Lillian Calhoun, Susan? And when I was first told the narrative of the Chicago Reporter, to be honest, um, I didn't know about Lillian Calhoun. So I'm all about saying John McDermott and Lillian Calhoun as the co-editors, and they were a powerful combination. So just to kind of back to your point, though, about the, the founding, we were designed, and I was just reading the letter uh, from Lillian and John with the first issue back in July of 1972, and it was to measure the city's progress toward racial equality. And I, I like to joke and say that I think they both think, wow, we're not there yet, right? So we have to continue to publish. So, But measuring that progress toward racial equality was really the essence of what they wanted to do. And I like to say they were visionaries because, you know, you think about it, not just coming out of the civil rights era and the social justice movements, they realized it was important to have media that actually focused on this. But the other part, too, was that they understood the value of data. You know, and before there was a thing called data journalism, they were all about, let's look at the numbers. So they were way ahead of the curve. So. Now to Catalyst, uh, our, our sister publication. It's been wonderful to look at bringing Catalyst together with the reporter because when we think about you know, social justice or racial equality, where is education in that? Education is a critical part of it. Yes. And if you look at the historic civil rights agenda, you know, it's been about education. And what role does access to quality 
education have, what role does that play in alleviating racial inequality and creating a more just society through creating opportunity? So for me, when we had the opportunity to combine Catalyst and the reporter, it seemed perfect because now we were bringing in education, a critical part of any kind of agenda for social change and specifically a long time piece of the civil rights agenda. Uh, so it's a good marriage. <laughs> yeah, good. I'm glad to hear that. Susan Smith Richardson, I would like to ask you a little bit more about education and particularly charter schools. Uh, in the 49th Ward, we uh, <clears throat> got a, a ballot initiative through that says no more charters no more charter expansion. It actually uh, says, asks for a freeze. And actually there's, there's been a lot of support for that on the north side among politicians, but at the same time we see an expansion of charter schools in black communities. And uh, we tend to be pretty critical of charter schools, that they're non-union, that uh, you know they pay less to the teachers, et cetera, et cetera. But can you address that, uh, the kind of affection for charter schools that is apparently uh, showing itself in the black community? Mm -hmm. You know, that's a great question, and I'm not going to tell you I'm an expert on charters here or how people feel about them, but I am going to, um, over the years in a lot of cities and in, in, in African American communities nationally, you do see this kind of uh, ambivalence about the role of charters. So let me just kind of give you an anecdote about when I first moved here. Um, I've written about charters in other states. In Texas, for example, I wrote a lot of editorials around education. Um, and I remember when charters started, you know, creeping into the conversation when Bush was governor of Texas and before he became president, and having a lot of strong feelings about privatizing, or as I like to say, outsourcing what should be a public good. Mm -hmm. um, that's my strong feeling about yeah. charters. But I, you know, when I moved here, um, it became kind of a more nuanced feeling because I realized I looked at neighbors in in, in my building. I live um, in the Woodlawn neighborhood. Um, and feeling like, wait a minute, I want my kids to have an opportunity. And the failure of the public school system, especially the high schools, meant that parents were looking for other options. And when you start looking at it, I thought, I can understand why many African American parents would want to opt out of the public school system and send their kids, if they can, to you know, Catholic schools, send their kid to a charter school, or if they can do something better than that, even, they will. Latinos, too. Yeah. And this is really, you know, a, a function of a failure of proper investment and support for public education. Of course. So for me, while I understand <clears throat> parents wanting choices, what parent doesn't want the best for their kid, the larger issue here is really the struggle over that investment. And, and I hope that through our coverage as we move forward, um, we're actually looking at a story right now that begins to look a lot more at what's happened with those schools that were closed by Mayor Emanuel um, almost three years ago. And kind of a part of looking at what happened to those schools is also looking at the loss of neighborhood schools, which have in turn been replaced by charter schools. So I hope that we'll have something thoughtful and meaningful to share in the next couple of months around that issue. We'll look forward. Change tracks right now just to uh, talk about the election um, and your opinion about um, how would you assess the media coverage uh, this election year? This and was really, going up to yeah. right now the, the transition. Well, I, I wish that we would have learned from what happened during the campaign, but I'm not sure that that lesson has been learned. Um, you know, Christian Amanpour, who I don't often try to quote, I mean, I think she's a fine international journalist, mm -hmm. but when she received an award recently, she talked about the fallacy of, you know, equating, um, well, she used her experience covering war crimes right. and, and, and acts of genocide. She said it's important to not equate the victims with the aggressors. And we saw a lot of that kind of straw man politics during this campaign. So. If um, Trump was called on racism, then he'd turn around and say, well, Hillary Clinton's husband did this, and look at what he did with welfare reform. These kind of false equivalencies are really dangerous. And she pointed that out. I, I bring that up to say that throughout the campaign, we saw journalists who have not really mastered coverage of race anyway fall into that time and time again to actually get caught up in an argument that says the Klan and Black Lives Matter 
are the same Jeez. is outrageous. outrageous. That doesn't even need to be a conversation because historically, factually, on every level, that's just flat out wrong. But we saw a lot of that going on um, through, especially through broadcast out broadcast outlets like CNN, and that really muddies the water. I think for every New York Times story, Washington Post story, or you know, name the outlet story that didn't do that, I think what we have to remember is. Most Americans, you know, are probably seeing CNN and the chatter between the pundits and the reporters. They're not seeing the New York Times. They're not seeing the Washington no, Post. That's right. And they were also, you know, being fed a lot of fake news because people are getting news through social media. <coughs> so we don't realize how uh, really a handful of places drive the conversation and perception of mm -hmm. people about what's happening. Huge. But, the, but the other part that's really been sad to me <coughs> moving forward is We've gotten past this, you know, really shocking election that has put everybody's, uh, to me, problems on blast, the problems of the media, the problems of the American political system, um, deep divisions in the electorate. We've gotten past that, but we're still having conversations that are about normalizing what's just happened. So now you see, and we've had it on some local radio stations, the whole story about well, you know, how are we going to get through Thanksgiving? Because I have to go sit next to Uncle So-and-so who voted for <laughs> Trump and I voted for Hillary. And, you know, I wish it were that simple. But no, I don't think the issue was to say, oh, we'll have to help you deal with their stress. It's like at the end of the day, I think that was a message that was to, to white people and certainly not to African Americans right. or Latinos or Muslims who I don't think would be having that conversation. Yeah at Thanksgiving anyway. I didn't with my, my own family and friends. We didn't have any but, Trump supporters at my dinner table. Well, good for you. <laughs> but, but what I do want to point out, though, is this. To say that we need to find common ground really minimizes how significant what Trump said and what he may do is. And that tends to make us think, oh, it's just like any other e election, when in fact it really isn't. No. There's a real fundamental political and social upheaval going on in the country, and it can't be marginalized. Like this presidency can't be normalized. And I think the media is already starting to do that. Um, sorry. You think they're starting to normalize it? Or sure. To? Sure. Yeah, so yeah. Are, you think, are there any people in the media that we might look to? They won't try to normalize it. They will see themselves as part of the resistance. Well, her. <laughs> well, yeah, I know that. And, you know, we don't really cover it directly. Right. I mean, um, I, I, think it's, I think it's complicated. Probably, so who do I think? Well, you know, people you could expect. Mother Jones. You can expect the nation to a large extent and Mother Jones. Daily Coast. Sure. You know, to, and, and a lot of uh, web-based sites, news sites are not going to do that. But I think even people who think they're not um, need to really think about not just the stories they're telling, but how to reach people. Because what concerns me more is that as news organizations, um, I do feel like we're we're in a, we're part of an echo chamber too, and we're not thinking so much about how we could focus our news more directly at communities. You know, I had a crazy experience after the election. It wasn't election related, but it was a wake up call for me because so often, you know, I'm thinking about, okay, here's a story we're going to do. It has impact. We've got to get it out there. But I spoke to a crowd of more than 300 people. I mean, to directly take information to 300 people and see what people know, what they don't know, how they Google their news is an eye opener because you, re you realize most people are source agnostic. It doesn't matter where it came from, they don't know where it came from. It's not a critique, it's a reality. So I think we need to be thinking about our news, whether it's about Trump or anyone else, in, in with that mindset. Boy, we could we could talk a long time about well, let's the, invite her back. About the narrow <laughs> line that you just described that we all have to be aware of for the first time in our lives politically. What you just described, this this road that we're on, <clears throat> where we can neither normalize the hatred and the smallness that we saw in the campaign that won, nor can we pretend that the two-party system didn't deliver us this on a silver platter with its shortcomings and its lack of 
representation yeah, over absolutely. the years. Very complicated. I'd like to ask one final question of this segment. I'm so sorry. We're hey, that's okay, we're Kate. We only have enough. Don't worry about it. Don't, you, don't use the time. Okay. Um, <laughs> my question is, has Rom turned the corner after a terrible year since his re-election, and who might challenge Rom? Tony, Chewy, Lori Lightfoot, Dart? Oh, I'm so, I'm so not Miss Cleo. You remember Miss Cleo? <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> who actually got indicted. Didn't she go to prison? So I'm not going to be like Miss Cleo and make predictions. I don't think he's turned the corner. Um, you know, mm. how's that for a, sh a short, concise answer? Yeah, I like I it. So <laughs> I was worried he might have. <laughs> no. Yeah, and even though he is, you know, I think he'd like to see Trump's ascendance as the best thing that could have ever happened mm -hmm. to him because, mm -hmm. in truth, he looks a lot better he you in comparison. To run well, he did. Exactly. He did look good on the sanctuary mm -hmm. city thing, and well, that was sure. good. And sure. uh, Harold Washington is mm -hmm. the one we can thank for that. He's yep. the one thank who first. Help. That's right. Who That's first kept mm -hmm. immigration at bay when they tried to enter the post office many years ago. But this point is, it'll be interesting to see, to to your point, if the Trump presidency does kind of give folks something else to push against and gives the mayor, you know some room to, you know, renegotiate his public image. I don't know. I, I tend to think that, you know, lo our local issues are still our local issues. Yeah. Around the policing stuff, it could probably only get worse with Sessions as the Attorney General and the fact that, you know, you know what will happen with this consent decree when the uh, DOJ finishes its investigation of the police department. Um, I think that that may give the mayor some kind of out but it's not going to change the reality of what's happening locally, and he's still going to be held accountable, I would think. Susan Smith Richardson, editor, uh, publisher of the Chicago Reporter, could you please come back on a monthly basis? Because wow. we are dealing with the stuff that we talk about every single week, and you have your hands on the pulse, so I'm going to I'm gonna put your name up as a, a stand-in host for when we've got a missing host. Oh, well, you know, I'm seriously flattered, and I will be happy to come back. Um, there, there's a lot to talk about. Lot to talk about. Thanks for coming on. It's really great to meet you. Thank you. Very really glad you. to have Appreciate you. It. Uh, you are listening to Live from the Heartland. It's 88.7 FM on your dial. Chicago Sound Alliance. And we're going to hear a little bit of music from our friend Pablo Menendez and the band Mezla de Cuba. Where I think we're going to hear uh, I'll See You in Cuba. And we'll be right back with more Live from the Heartland. 